Good afternoon. A, a, a big thank you for the invitation to come here and to all the people who have been behind the scenes putting it together. I grew up in Zimbabwe, was educated in um, South Africa and graduated in 72. Since then I have been a professional research scientist, first in Zimbabwe, then South Africa and in 91 I moved to the States. And I don't believe in sustainability. We've wrecked everything, we need to regenerate. I also grew up on a farm, so the research I do, I make sure it is of relevance to farmers and is conducted with farmers. So I'm a little bit different to a lot of scientific goals. My goal is to use a whole systems framework, not just little bitty research plots, to find out what is the best management for regenerating livelihoods and social resilience and the delivery of ecosystem goods and services. It also concerns me that there's a huge discrepancy between summer research and rancher achievements. Since I've be, been a researcher, I've had the wonderful opportunity of traveling around the world. Wherever I go, I make sure that I meet the leading conservation ranchers so I can learn from them. And um, so I've got a lot of experience with uh, the guys on the ground, and of course, I keep in touch with the research. They couldn't be more different, and we'll delve into that as we go through. Farmers need to know how does the whole landscape, nobody manages small plots, everybody manages a landscape. And how good is a particular management tool? You don't just do research to say, what happens if I do it this way? You need to find out, okay, what's the best that it can do? And where does it work? And where does it not work? And how do we make it work as much as possible? And what combination of management decisions achieve the best results? The leading farmers and ranchers produce so much more uh, better than everybody else, and it's the way they put everything together. We need to learn those things. Generally, research doesn't do that. Also, what will work on my particular farm? Generally, research, do none of the, uh, research scientists do none of these things. I'm going to dwell on the, the um, scientific process because so much science these days is agenda-driven and doesn't follow the scientific process. There is no such thing as consensus in science. Scientists are expected to look for refutations of existing hypotheses. A lot of the research in grazing management is very dogmatic and this is the way it is, when the ranchers within 15, 20 miles are achieving far superior results and they don't see a discrepancy between the two, they just say, well, we're right and they're wrong. Absolute rubbish. So, Science proceeds by observation, an hypothesis that attempts to explain the, uh, the uh, observation, and then testing in an attempt to refute it. And the research I'm going to put in front of you now, I will tell you the hypothesis that we've been testing, how we attempted to refute it, and we'll start off by looking at the observations that I've gathered around the world that led me to create that hypothesis. So a single refutation is grounds for hypothesis modification, something that's escaped a lot of people who have done science in grazing management. And rig rigidly defending an hypothesis against tr contradictory evidence is not good science. For those who know me, we've been in a running battle with people with fixed mindsets who refuse to acknowledge that things like this happen. I've seen people manage from one side to the next in South Africa, in Zimbabwe, in North America, Patagonia, with good management, only good management. So it really, I find it really mind-boggling that so many rangeland scientists still believe that there is no reason to favor rotational grazing over continuous grazing and conservation stocking. Part of that is they don't realize that rotational grazing is not what's achieved these spectacular results. And they don't know the difference between what has and what is their form of rotational grazing. So is it possible that this is due to the way science is conducted? Very possible, and that is my belief. So we'll, we'll examine that. When you're managing the land, and because of that, when you are doing research, you need to understand these four things. The four ecosystem blocks that make an ecosystem function. You need energy to drive it. The water cycle is critically important. Cycling of minerals, critically important. And having biodiversity there, all the right plants in the right place, um, is critical to making it function. That's what you need to manage for. 
And in 2004, I thought I was pretty smart, you know, got a PhD and stuff. And I went to one of Elaine Ingham's um, talks in Waco, Texas, to HMI meeting. And I increased my knowledge threefold in 40 minutes. <laughs> I re it really made me understand a little bit more how things work. These little critters below the soil control everything. They need the energy, as other people have said before us. It is astounding how little research in range management has even looked at the main drivers of the ecosystems that we manage. But this is where it all happens. And just the same as the stomach and a car, this is where it all happens. Now, some of the research that we've done in our location, on the, there's erosion, interall uh, erosion, that increases as you're going right. You've got, on the right-hand side, you've got bare soil. To the left of it, you've got short grasses, then mid-grasses and woody components. As you go right, your runoff increases. Infiltration is highest on the left-hand side and decreases as you go right. This is where you need to be, and very few people are there. Most people are around about there, particularly in Texas which has got a number of problems and is not doing too well on this front. You need to manage from that side to that side um, to actually stay in business and to keep your business floating and also provide the goods and services that Homo sapiens needs. So <clears throat> let's look what happens in a continuously grazed situation. This is a 3,000 acre uh, area in Texas. Those little green dots are GPS points from cows that been uh, in that paddock for a year. And you'll notice they just spend their time where they want to. And of course, they graze everything just, and they don't overgraze any of that, do they? <laughs> Rubbish. That's where all the damage is taking place. And there's underutilization in the back end of the pasture. This is what's happening in a, in a ranch scale setting. This is a close up of where they graze. Within that presence, they are grazing certain plants, nubbing them off, and right around that you've got taller grasses that aren't taken off. And um, how much photosynthesis is taking place in that little area? On the green plants, quite a bit, but the self-shading plants, not. Those areas are being nubbed off all the time. How do you, do you think the roots are? What do you think the nutrient cycling is on that whole area? Good in some areas and pretty poor in others, okay? And during a drought, those plants that have been heavily hit there, grazed short, what happens to them? They've got shallow roots. They die. Suddenly you've got bare ground. What happens with bare ground? Water runs off. So let's look at some of the research. This is the scale at which research has been conducted. And when you look at any one of those plots, you can see that none of them would represent the impact that the animals are having on that whole landscape. So when you operate at a small scale, you are completely misconstruing the damage that is causing at the commercial scale. And research has just not looked at that. If you add to that the fact that most research only happens over a couple of years, and changes in, in these uh, environments, um, if you improve your management today, it's going to take four or five, six years um, to be able to measure any differences. Science misses that unless it's going on for long enough. We know, right around the world, that many agraziers use regenerative multi-paddock grazing successfully. And in most countries, most conservation winners use multi-paddock grazing of some form. So what are we doing with regenerative multi-paddock grazing? We put in water points where they might be necessary. We put animals in one of those paddocks. And when it's grazed the right amount, you move to the next one, and so on. You do not come back to that first grazed one until it has recovered. This is the way you apply it. So you can control how much is grazed, the period of grazing, the length and time of recovery, and you can manage according to the needs of your wildlife. Those who've done holistic management know exactly what I'm talking about. The result is you graze more of the whole landscape, you spread the grazing over the whole area, and you select a wider variety of plant species. This is what makes for improvements. Let's look at an example of some research that's been done. 
This is an area run by the Noble Foundation. You'll see in there a couple of little blue stem plants, but a lot of green ragweed and stuff like that. This has been beaten up. This is tall grass prairie. Um, you should have tall grasses growing there. So what they did is they put a water point in there and 18 paddocks with, with a single wire fence and they managed to improve the plant species. What that entailed is you put them in, when they've grazed a species you want to look after, the right amount, you move them out and you don't come back in again until those plants have recovered. These are the results they got. On the left hand side, animal unit days. On the, uh, you, you can see that it went from 88 all the way to 97. In the middle there you see a couple of little dips in the improvement. What are those due to? Yeah, droughts. You carry on improving in droughts, but don't expect an improvement every single year. It's a slow process that builds upon itself. So they achieved nearly a fourfold increase over that length of time. I'm working with ranchers now that are operating up to 6,000 animals in some of their things, in some of their herds, um, that have achieved exactly the same magnitude of improvement uh, in six to seven years. So this is not a fluke thing. This is happening all over the place. Um, every, every country I've been to, we've seen this. So how, what caused those positive results? Flexible stocking to manage, for, uh, to match forage and, abil and availability uh, with animal numbers. Spread the grazing over the whole, f whole ranch. Defoliate moderately in the growing season. Use short graze periods. These are good for animals and good for the plants. Provide an adequate recovery before regrazing. Graze again before the forage is too mature. In tall grass prairie, you have to look out for this. Drier areas, you do not. And adaptively change with changing conditions. We'll come back to that when we look at the research results. So on the left-hand side, high density grazing with short graze, good recovery. Look how much photosynthesis has taken place in that landscape. What do you think the, the water cycle's all doing there? It's pretty darn good, lots of litter on the ground, etc. We'll look at these results later. But everything is humming along nicely. The one on the right, with much lower stocking rate, we've seen that before. Most things are not happening all that well. It's a safe thing because you're not overgrazing too much, but those plants that are being grazed off in the middle there are definitely being overgrazed. Let's look now at fire and continuous grazing. Look at the amount of bare ground there. The way people apply fire, of course, it's quite a bit of bare, uh, bare ground. As, as Christine said, you can do it so there's less bare ground there. But how long do you think it takes before the, the bare ground is covered over to where it was before the burn? We've looked at that, and it happens to be two average growing seasons or better. How many years does it take to get two average growing seasons? Yep. Well, we are, it's between five and eight. So you're not recovering until that length of time. Unless you've applied your burn, it doesn't create so much bare ground. On the right, high density grazing, lots of productivity, nice green colored plants, everything's ticking over well there, good litter cover. Uh, that's a comparison. You can use fire, but you must know that it comes at a price. Let's look at periodic grazing versus no grazing. If you periodically graze tall grass prairie, then you, the whole system is working well. That's what happened when, when the bison were around. And high diversity, productive plants, everything working well. All four of the ecosystem uh, processes are happening well. On the right, an ungrazed area, um, ungrazed because the people were anti-cattle, and it's dominated by big blue stem and little, uh, little blue stem where there was, uh, the soil um, was there. How well do you think those four ecosystem service um, elements are working. Good, bad, indifferent? Okay, let's have a close look at it. I think a lot of you know um, the EKG land ecograph, where you've got the mineral cycling on the left hand side, water cycling, the biotic stat, and energy flow. Water cycling is high, mineral cycling is low, biotic state is low, and energy flow is low. That's what you've got in that picture I've just showed you. If you put in planned grazing, so you've got periodic grazing, the right amount. That's what you've got, okay? All four functions are working well. So there's your choice. The people who don't want cars around, look at the price you're paying for not having cars around, not having grazers around. 
Some of the best research that's been done, really hard science, is done by a paleogeologist, Greg Ritalik, an Australian who's living now in Oregon. And he studied the, uh, the changes in um, grazing plant relationships um, uh, over the, in the past history. And uh, we're going to be dealing with the effect of predators with large herds and how they interact with the development of grasslands, grasses, and soils. The left-hand column there, 50 million years ago, the soils, you look down at the bottom there, were akin to arid shrubland soils that we get today. And there were shrubs there with a few little grasses, a fairly unproductive um, and not very fertile soil. 30 million years ago, there are more grasses, there's less shrubs, slowly the fertility has increased and you're starting to get more grazers, but none of them are herd grazers yet. Suddenly there was a huge change 20 million years ago where you see the darker soil and much greater fertility, and then to seven million years ago, that same trend continued with even deeper and richer soils. What happened here was the, the, the paleo signature was, this is when the, the large herds developed. The, the pack hunting animals that chased those herds around happened at this period in time. And the, the, the kind of grasses that grew there, sod grasses now, uh, and the periodic grazing that took place because animals were moving around looking for food and being chased by herbivores, uh, by uh, oh, her, wolves, etc., cetera, um, <laughs> changed the situation completely, and that steadily increased. Um, and, and the signature, all the species involved, and the effects, the, the different attributes of the plants, very strong from uh, hard data that was collected. So we're looking at, Greg reckons that that caused global cooling when the formation of these grassland soils. So around the world, in grassland regions with 10 to 30 inches of precipitation, the co-evolution of grass and grazers caused the global expansion of carbon-rich soils. From 30 million years ago, this likely induced decreased carbon dioxide in the air, global cooling, and decreased precipitation. The signature from ice cores from the paleogeological record in that is very, very uh, strong there. There was one outlier, Australia. There weren't large herds of herbivores in Australia. Um, the top graph there, you can see there's a desert grassland and forest. The top graph is uh, soil organic carbon, the bottom one, soil organic nitrogen. We've got Africa as an example in here. The red is Australia. You can see as the rainfall in increases from uh, left to right, you get a peaking of the amount of organic carbon in the ground in the grasslands, drops off a little bit in the forests, and in Australia it's way, way less. Ditto with the nitrogen in the bot bottom graphic. So when the white settlers arrived in Australia, the soils were relatively poor compared to other continents. Uh, that was before the introduction of sheep, cattle, and pasture improvement. And with the introduction of sheep, cattle, and pasture improvement with legumes, dung beetles, um, the fertility improved, particularly as you saw with the Colin Sass example that Christine gave, it can Im improve a huge amount. So within our living lifetimes, we've seen when you introduce what the, the bison and large herds introduced to a place like Australia where it wasn't present before, um, it has actually moved forward. And we've seen this in the recent history where continuous grazing that had degraded the environment, uh, pictured on the left there, uh, with really good management, in this case that of Neil Dennis, but also many other people achieved it. Look at the difference in those soils in half a dozen years. Moved from an infiltration rate of his neighbors they measured the other day of one inch an hour. They measured it on, on Neil Dennis's place the other day, 16 inches an hour continuing to improve. Peter Donovan started off measuring there, and uh, he's documented this very well. So let's look at the previous research that's been done on grazing. Generally, they had no goal to achieve best results. Generally, scientists don't manage, say, I'm managing this to get the best results in terms of soil or plants or pastures. They just they do it a way, and they measure the result, and they present that. Ranches are different. They need to manage in a way, and they do. It's in their interest to improve. They've ignored the influence of spatial scale of commercial ranches, which I've shown to you earlier. If you've got a small plot, 
and, and you do an experiment on that, it is not going to show you what has happened on a commercial ranch. Research has generally been very short term. I've published this, um, the, the references at the bottom there, and that most research uses small plots where they reduce the variation um, and they use an experimental design that is good for getting a paper, but it has very little relevance to a managed landscape. And generally it's been studied under artificial conditions. Christine Jones told you the work on fungi, some people actually sterilize the soil to make sure it's all the same and then try and study the effects of fungi. That's an entirely different ball game to seeing where you've got a, a, a community that is such that you've got high fungi and next to it with a community that's got low fungi and you do an experiment in the field, those are entirely different things and research hasn't taken cognizance of that. Um, and universally, the research has not um, had adequate recovery periods, but so have the holistic management guys. I've only realized in the last 10 years or so that in fact the, the recovery periods that they were advocating were far less. They've improved that and everybody has benefited from that. And one of the fatal mistakes is having too many animals uh, before the, science, uh, the plants and uh, soil have, have actually improved. And managing proactively as conditions change um, does not achieve good results. When you look at ranches, where they've failed to get positive results is too many animals, not developing stock water adequately, inadequate planning. Planning is absolutely essential. The, the um, holistic management planning and stuff by Dave Pratt uh, is absolutely essential to achieving good outcomes not tap adapting to conditions as they change. If you've got twice the rainfall in one year compared to another, you need to change. And if people don't do that, they don't get good results. So defoliating too heavily uh, in the growing season always sets things back and hurts your animal performance. Long grazing periods causes localized overgrazing. Inadequate recovery causes plants to produce poorly and breaks down your ecosystem functions. Also, if you try and make improvements where conditions are very limiting, like on shallow soil, you will get reduced results. The best results you get are where the highest potential is, and often that has been ignored. The hypothesis, after all these observations I've made around the world, looking at existing uh, science that had been done with the soil microbes, and we put together the hypothesis that at the commercial ranch scale, planned multipatic grazing when proactively managed to give the best vegetation and animal performance has the potential to produce superior long-term conservation and restoration of resources, ecosystem goods and services, and ranch profitability. So we worked with ranchers to test that. Now, bearing in mind we're looking at large landscapes, so we have to look at whole ranches. So what we did was we located three counties and we looked at three grazing managements. Heavy continuous grazing, the norm for that area. Light continuous grazing, what the universities were, were uh, talking about. And uh, multipatic grazing well managed in each of those counties. So this is three replicates really um, for a statistical point of view. So what we looked at was we had neighboring ranches in each county. The best case scenario for multipatic grazing was planned holistic management at roughly 10 acres per animal unit. The usual case grazing was continuous grazing at about the same rate. Best case scenario was continuous grazing at half that rate. That, that's about the NRCS uh, recommendation. And each one of those ranches had been managed the same way for 10 years to allow the ecosystem to react and adjust to that particular treatment so we adequately represented it. These are results. Look at the amount of bare ground on neighboring ranches. That's huge. 30% in, in a 30 inch rainfall area. And look how much less there is in the heavy multiplant camp grazing. Huge difference. We'll come back to that. Tall grasses. You'll see in the middle there. Uh, these are the most productive. You'll see the, the blue column there is 2,500. That's the most productive. Um, if there's twice the stocking rate on that compared to the light continuous, why do you think we're getting more grass? Because that's all the ice cream grass we're talking about, these, these big blue stem and stuff. The reason is 
They were managed by grazing them moderately, getting off them till they'd recovered. Whereas in the light continuous, animals go to water, they come back, they know everywhere where every one of those big blue stem plants is, and they will go back to it and nibble it if it's regrown at all. That's why there's such a discrepancy there. The next most productive grasses are the mid grasses, and you'll see there um, the light continuous grazing, that was the major portion uh, of it. Annual forbs, now this is what people call weeds and they want to go and spray. And you can see that they were only really a problem on the heavy continuous. Bare ground provides an establishment site for those uh, annual forbs, um, ragweed and, and stuff like that. So um, those are the differences we got there. People say, right, the concentration of animals is going to cause your soil to mess up. Nope. It's my belief that because we managed in a manner that created the, the dominance by those tall grass species, the soil was sufficiently robust that it recovered quickly from the short grazing period they got. So the, the heavy multi-camp grazing had the least compacted soils on those ranches, counter to much research that's been done. Soil microbes drive the system, and you'll see there with grazing management, heavy continuous, light continuous, multi-paddock, and grazing exposure. The total bacteria, pretty much the same all the way through. The little red figures, if they're the same, there's no significant difference. Total fungi, you'll see that the multi-paddock was highest, followed by the grazing exclosure. Then the big difference comes when you look at the fungal to bacterial ratio. Remember what David just told you about fungal to bacterial ratio? Fungi are really, really important, so that is a good thing. They've dealt with this. No need to say anything other than you need these things and you need to manage for them. What fungi like is if there's, as soon as, when there's growing conditions and there's photosynthesis taking place, the fungi are being fed and then they're working for you. So you need to build that into your management. Organic matter. The blue is multi-paddock. The green, light continuous, and the red, heavy continuous. Uh, we started off as the red at about 4% in the, in the shallow portion of the soil. And uh, with the multi-paddocks, after 10 years, they had recovered. They, they were under the same management prior. Uh, they recovered now. They're pretty close together, the blue and the greens, but they were significantly different. And the total amount of carbon through the soil depth was much different. You look at the MP compared to the HC, it was three tons of carbon per hectare difference, which is 1.2 tons per acre of carbon difference. That's a lot of difference developed over 10 years. And what does that mean? Here you've got soil organic matter was highest in the multi-paddock. The cation exchange capacity, the, the nutrients was highest uh, multi-paddock, as was the water holding capacity. Every farmer I know wants to be in the right-hand place there, but very few actually manage for it, um, and we know how to do it. And that's really where we want to go. You put carbon in the ground, you get water in the ground, makes everything work. So regenerative grazing research that we've done shows ecological function and profitability increase with an increasing number of paddocks. Both my field research and the modeling research I've done show the same thing. Short periods of grazing with adequate recovery give the best profit and ecological function. Adjusting regenerative multipaddock management with changing conditions increases ecological function and profitability. The converse is that if you run it with fixed periods, i.e. you don't change as your rainfall changes from one year to the, to the next, fixed management results in much fewer benefits even though you've got the same number of paddocks, a high number of paddocks. Profitability decreases if recovery is too short or too long. Too short, plants aren't recovering. Too long, they're getting mature in, our, in that neck of the woods. And stocking rates can be increased without damaging ecological function as the number of paddocks is increased. The number of farmers who are really successful, that's exactly what they found. And we can go into that in more detail. And to achieve these regenerative results, I've given these before, it's the same old method, whether we're doing the modeling or the field assessment, this is, these are all the things that you do, and this is what's built into holistic management. And there's plenty of um, references to that. Now, we used those same uh, figures. Those ranches we got there, Dangle, Meyer, Pittman, and Mitchell, are some of the ranches we've been working on. This is the watershed that spreads from Wichita Falls down to Denton in that little circle on the bottom right. 
And the green denotes rangeland. The little bit of yellow there is uh, winter wheat. Uh, so most of it is cropping. We used ARS uh, watershed models and we tested the model. The, the water that's been running down into Denton has been measured for nearly 90 years. But we only had cattle numbers on each ranch in that whole watershed since 1980. So the, 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 the exercise was from 1980 to 2013. There was a very close match between the model's predictions and the, the amount of water that had been measured and, and the, um, the, the quality of the water that had been measured um, over the years uh, on the bottom right. So this is basically what we're looking at. You've got holistic, the two columns on the left are heavy continuous, then light continuous, multi-paddock and, and exclosure. The red gives you surface runoff. The groundwater flow is in blue. And the groundwater flow means the water that came in that actually went into the soil and didn't run off. Look at the HC. The surface runoff is hugely greater than the amount that went in the soil. On LC, they're about the same. They're not significantly different from each other. On the MP, much more went into the soil um, than runoff. And on the exclosure, the grazing exclosure that we had, the same story. But remember the grazing exclosure. How good were the four ecosystem um, functional blocks with that exclosure? The water capture was good. All the others were poor. So you've got to remember that. It looks real good here. But in terms of the total ecosystem, uh, the multi-paddock uh, grazing was much better because you had the periodic disturbance with the animals and adequate recovery. So everything was working really well there. So let's look at these results. Um, with respect to climate change mitigation. You guys should know that cows are real bad little beasties. They are the things that we should get rid of. Hang on. If you look at the sources of agricultural emissions, the left-hand column, total agriculture. The next one to the right, cropping plus erosion. Cropping, this is tillage and inorganic fertilizers and pesticides, there is a greenhouse gas signature associated with those things the way we currently practice them. That created that cropping figure. Soil erosion was both from cropping and poor grazing. It's very high. How does that come about? The erosion runs off, the, the soil gets in the water, all the organic matter that's in there gets wet, gets given off as N2O and methane. That's a large source of the, green, the uh, agricultural um, emissions. And look at ruminants. They're really small, aren't they? And they're only that big because they're eating corn, because we feed corn. If you didn't feed them corn and you grazed them, they wouldn't even appear on that map, which is what we're getting into here. We did a life cycle analysis on net carbon emissions using our data for cow-calf only, grazing, so we didn't take into account anything else. The practice change, HC to MP, the next column is uh, extra, uh, the extra carbon sequestered compared to the HC, the carbon emissions from the animals that occurred there, and the net carbon emissions. So you can see there that um, if you converted from heavy continuous to MP, you would gain a large amount of sequestered carbon. HC to LC, not so much and LC to MP, very little. The carbon emissions you'll see are higher on the, um, the HC and MP than on the LC, and that's by virtue of the number of animals involved. Now, in the southern plains, because the nutrition of the forage is relatively low, the emissions are higher than in other parts of the country. So we had to figure that in. We also figured in the signature from the protein supplements that we fed during winter. But the, look at the net emissions, assuming that the carbon that was fixed for these things was the 10 years that we uh, measured for the study. If, however, you do run different scenarios, if it was fixed for 10 years versus 15 years versus 20 years, you'll see the 10 years of what you've just seen. If 15 years, if it took that long to put in the ground, you saw a net sink for carbon. And after 20 years, only the LC to MP is not a sink. So there's a fairly robust 
And we're not even taking into account, this is the emissions from the cattle and only considering the carbon that's been put in the ground by the grazing. As Christine mentioned to you, the, the native background amounts of emissions is counted by the amount of methanotrophs that are in the soil. We've yet to measure that, so if you added that to the equation, these sinks would be even greater than what we've shown here. So let's look now at a wider picture of North American agriculture. What we've got here is on the left-hand uh, thing there is uh, <coughs> axis, net GHG emissions and gigatons of carbon a year. This is from published data with current cropping practices while adop adopting regenerative grazing practices. The left-hand column there, the green is livestock production, the total emissions that we showed earlier. The red is farm soil erosion, and the blue is fertilizer cropping. The total emissions every year is just less than 0.3. If you reduce the ruminants by 50%, how much difference does that make? Almost nothing. If, however, with continuous, with current cropping, and you adopted regenerative grazing practices on 25% of the grazable acres, look how much the offsets, it almost offsets completely the signature of agriculture. If you add more, 50% or 100%, then it adds even more. This is now a serious reduction of carbon uh, from the atmosphere and putting it into the soil. If you adopted regenerative cropping, as well as regenerative grazing, look how much more it actually adds to the equation. So in conclusion, the regenerative uh, multi-paddock grazing can build soil organic carbon and microbial function, enhance water infiltration retention, build fertility, increase photosynthesis, increase growing days, control erosion more effectively, enhance wildlife, uh, and biodiversity with appropriate modifications to management, enhance watershed ecological function, improve economic returns while improving the resource base, and result in grazed soils being a stronger net greenhouse sink, greenhouse gas sink. I would like to and have to acknowledge all the help I've had. A lot of people have helped me in this. Clint Josie and the Dixon Water Foundation have funded my research. Texas A&M AgriLife Research, um, people high up in the organization recruited me from Africa, and although most of the antagonisms toward rotational grazing emanate from uh, people at my level in the system, the people up above me have supported me fantastically and encouraged all the way. None of us could have done any of this without the successful ranchers that we've worked with, and uh, they are the leaders that we've got to follow in the future. NRCS have been a great help as have HMI educators like Kirk and uh, Peggy Sacrist. Uh, Savory Institute, Ditto, has been a great help. Alan Savory, the intellectual leader of regenerative grazing, been a huge fellow to bounce things off, and Jody is always a supportive person too. Working now with a group of systems-oriented ecologists, and uh, we're gonna carry on with this, this work and do it in different parts of the country and probably overseas as well and my research staff, we have to do all the work while I jolly around at conferences like this. So I would just like to put in a plug for, we need to work with leading ranchers. Scientists can't work on their own. They've got to work with leading ranchers because that's the only way you can study whole systems and how different things work together to provide decent results. The academics working on grazing in this country are about 30 years behind the leading ranchers. The people working on cropping scientists, many of them are 20 years behind the leading guys like Gabe like Gay, uh, Brown. That's gotta stop. We've gotta bring the ranching community in as part of the people who are involved in the grazing. And I would encourage young people, get into the game and work with the people who are managing the land. That's the best way we can improve things.